Hey, Night Riders, disregarding Henry here with another episode of Cult Sandwich. David Cronenberg. Now there is a difficult filmmaker to pin down. He sort of defies all categorization. Rarely has a body of work been so varied, yet so distinct. He started as an underground filmmaker in Canada's burgeoning experimental film scene in the late 60s, progressing to low-budget shockers by the 70s, before achieving major recognition in the 80s with a few surprise box office hits. He would go on to drastically switch gears in the 90s, adapting transgressive works of literature, and today has evolved into a respected dramatist with a worldwide cult following. But if Cronenberg is famous for anything, it's one very particular brand of film making, a visceral, disturbing horror subgenre, one he himself is largely responsible for inventing, that we now know as body horror. Before him, horror was pretty much all about scary monsters, sinister shadows, or psychotic killers. The Cronenberg version of horror was completely different. It was much more personal. The threat came from within. The monster was biology. Over the course of several now legendary genre films, people grew to know and fear the name Cronenberg. He was dubbed Canada's Baron of Blood, and body horror quickly became a new method of terrifying audiences, with filmmakers all over the world eagerly borrowing his innovative ideas. If it's possible that one film embodies the concept of body horror more than any other and encapsulates Cronenberg's genius most completely, that is arguably his surreal 19 1983 thriller Videodrome. James Woods stars as Max Wren, the head of Civic TV, a small, sleazy television station specializing in cheap sex and violence. Max has grown dissatisfied, even bored with his current programming lineup. He knows the public is thirsty for something ever more extreme to stimulate their dulled senses. He's looking for the next big sensation, something harsh, something shocking, something dangerous, and he just may have found it in a rogue pirate signal called Videodrome. Consisting of nothing more than brutal torture and death, Max is instantly hooked. He sets out to discover where this signal came from and who is producing it. As he draws ever closer to Videodrome's sinister origins, he begins to realize not only that it might be genuine snuff TV, it may also be at the center of an insidious plot to invade the minds of television viewers everywhere. Max ends up unwittingly stumbling right into the middle of a strange kind of underground war, each side seeking to utilize the signal's bizarre side effects for their own demented ambitions. Malicious Vicious entrepreneur Barry Convex, played by Les Carlson, plans to harness its destructive potential to eliminate the depravity that has taken hold of society, and that Max has been shamelessly profiting from. While on the other side, reclusive media prophet Brian Oblivion, played by Jack Creeley, believes the signal contains the power to elevate mankind to a higher plane of existence. Max himself has already fallen under Videodrome's spell. Something in the signal is indeed infiltrating his consciousness, warping his perception of reality, grotesquely mutating his body. Before long, Max is tumbling down a rabbit hole of utter paranoia, hallucination, and kinky S&M sex with an enigmatic woman named Nikki Brand played by Deborah Harry, who develops a similar fixation on the signal. With his life and his sanity on the line, no one to trust, nowhere to hide, Max could end up as nothing more than a pawn in a grand scheme beyond his understanding. Or is that all in his head? By the early 80s, David Cronenberg had ascended to the top of the Canadian film industry. In fact, his whole career up to this point is almost like a chronicle of the very development of that industry. When he was starting out in the early 60s, writing, directing, filming, and editing his own 16mm short films while attending the University of Toronto, Canada had almost no film industry to speak of. Any Canadian artist with serious movie-making ambitions like Norman Jewison or Ted Kotcheff had no choice but to travel abroad to realize them. It wasn't until 1967 that the Canadian government, in an effort to support young indigenous filmmakers, established the Canadian Film Development Corporation, 
now known as Telefilm Canada. Cronenberg was able to receive grants that allowed him to make a few experimental features before landing a deal with a Montreal-based Cinepix, a production company specializing mostly in softcore pornography, to make his first legitimate productions. These films would attract huge amounts of controversy, sparking a discussion amongst Canadians about whether or not the taxpayers' money should be used to finance GASP horror movies. Even though, to everyone's consternation, Cronenberg's films were about the only ones funded by the government that actually turned a significant profit. By 1976, in an effort to further bolster their maturing film industry, Canada introduced what was apparently known as a capital cost allowance, a tax incentive that gave big breaks to citizens investing in movie productions. This meant that, when tax season rolled around towards the end of the year, and wealthy doctors and dentists and lawyers were looking to write off some excess income, every producer and director in Canada would come scrambling for their money. Cronenberg was soon making movies under this tax shelter. As 1979 rolled around, he was introduced to producers Pierre David, Dick Schouten, Victor Solnicki, and Claude Heroux who had established their own production company, Vision 4, to take advantage of the new opportunities afforded by the tax shelter. They would produce Cronenberg's next three films, a trio that solidified his reputation and style, beginning with The Brood in 1979. Vision 4 would dissolve shortly after the release of this film, after the death of co-founder Dick Schouten, but David, Solnicki, and Haru would quickly reform as Film Plan International, just in time to produce the sleeper hit Scanners in 1981. The tax shelter system had its virtues and its flaws. On the downside, the money to make these movies was only available during tax season, in the last few months of the year, basically September to December. If a film hadn't at least wrapped principal photography by the new year, the budget couldn't be written off by the investors, and actually being forced to pay for a film production was the last thing anyone wanted. This put a severe time crunch on the films. Cronenberg remembers the production of Scanners, in particular, as a nightmare. The schedule had been so compressed, he was forced to begin filming without a finished script, and struggled to work out the complex plot as he was shooting it, often creating scenes the morning of the day they went before the cameras. But more than that, this tax system was very easy to cheat with investors often writing off sums much larger than what was given to film productions. Not long after Videodrome was released, Cronenberg's third and final film of this era, the tax shelter laws were repealed entirely, and Cronenberg moved on to more stable and organized forms of finance. Well, sort of, but we'll get to that in a later video. Despite the chaos, this system did have its plus side. There was so much money floating around at this time that Cronenberg enjoyed a period of almost unrealized restrained creative freedom. The prevailing attitude at Film Plan went something like this. It's tax season again. Do you have any ideas for a movie, Cronenberg? Sure, I've got one. It's called The Brood. Great, make sure it's done before the end of the year. That was pretty much all the bureaucracy he had to deal with. Videodrome was greenlit in much the same way. September was rolling around, Cronenberg's producers asked him for an idea, and he sold them on a script he had begun working on in 1980, called Network of Blood. <laughs> At the time, it wasn't much more than a conspiracy thriller, inspired by Cronenberg's childhood pastime of hunting rogue television signals late at night, and occasionally stumbling across scrambled fragments that may or may not have been something horrible or forbidden. Further inspiration came in the writings of real-life media prophet Marshall McLuhan, who served as the basis for the character of Brian Oblivion, leader of the cult-like Cathode Ray mission, a shelter providing the less fortunate with their daily fix of television. Vision. As he progressed with the first draft, he found the story slowly began morphing into something else entirely. A bizarre portrait of madness and mutation. The whole concept became far more extreme and daring. Cronenberg wasn't sure if his producers would go for it. To his surprise, they loved it. And the project, now titled Videodrome, went right into production. Thanks to the success of Scanners, Cronenberg had attracted the attention of Hollywood, and this became his first film distributed and even partially financed by a major American studio. With a budget of nearly $6 million, his highest to date, Videodrome was far more organized than Scanners had been, 
but it still had its share of challenges. The first draft of the script was much more complex, ambitious, and graphic than Cronenberg thought he could achieve on this budget, or sneak past the censors of the time. It also didn't have an ending. He jumped right into a second draft, toning down the violence, the number of special effects set pieces, refining characters and story, but he still couldn't crack that ending. That didn't matter though, because tax season is tax season, and as he was forced to do with scanners, Cronenberg started filming without a finished script. Principal photography took place in late 1981, in Cronenberg's hometown and favorite movie setting, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Revisions on the script continued throughout shooting. The story was constantly evolving, with Cronenberg cutting scenes mercilessly to keep on schedule, including one that would have portrayed Max's television rising out of his bathtub like Venus on her half shell. Several other major effects pieces were created, then discarded as scenes were cut. The effects team's job was made extra tricky due to the fact that Cronenberg never uses storyboards, so no one was exactly sure what was going to be filmed, or how, on any given day. There were even a few occasions when the crew would set up for filming at that morning's location only for Cronenberg to suddenly tell them that the scene was all wrong, and they needed to pack up and move to another location. A few of them began to wonder whether this so-called director had any idea what he was actually doing. Cronenberg managed to maintain his confidence in the face of adversity, and the production wrapped in time for Christmas, only to start up again in March for effects inserts and reshoots. As long as principal photography was taken care of, the tax write-offs were safe. Even by the time he was doing the March reshoots, Cronenberg still hadn't quite solved the problem of how to properly end the film. He had come up with several ideas that didn't quite work, including one that apparently involved Max and Nikki joined together on the Videodrome set, engaging in polymorphous perversity with mutated sex organs. Two other endings were reportedly shot during principal photography, but proved unsatisfactory. Before an abandoned harbor was discovered on the last day of shooting, and Cronenberg worked out the idea for the final ending, though he did continue tinkering with it through March, reshooting it once again on a reconstructed set, until he finally felt he'd gotten it just right. With the film at last finished, Cronenberg ran into a whole new set of hurdles. As his first picture distributed by a major studio, he found himself dealing for the first time with the mechanisms of Hollywood. Mechanisms like test screenings. Videodrome was previewed for an audience in Boston, Massachusetts, when it was still a work in progress. And it could have gone better. Cronenberg admits that it was partially his fault the screening was such a disaster. His approach to editing has always been to cut the movie as short and lean as possible. Sometimes too short. The version of the movie that was previewed was only 75 minutes long, and oblique to the point of utter incoherency. It was so bad, Universal Studios didn't even bother testing it a second time. Nonetheless, Cronenberg did find the experience useful, and worked to build the narrative back up. What he didn't find so useful was his experience with the MPAA. Universal wasn't going to release an X-rated film, so Cronenberg was obliged to trim the more graphic moments of sex and violence to secure an R rating. To add insult to injury, Cronenberg claims Universal Chief of Marketing and Distribution Bob Remy asked for additional cuts on top of that. The whole affair left him feeling bitter for years afterwards, but on the positive side he was glad that Universal remained committed to releasing and promoting the film, rather than trying to bury or block it from release. Videodrome hit theaters in early 1983. Audiences didn't understand it much better than the puzzled studio executives, who had no idea how to market this monstrosity. It was pulled from screens not long after opening. A financial flop. Despite winning Cronenberg a genie, or the Canadian equivalent of an Oscar for Best Director, Videodrome failed to make much of an impression. Cronenberg didn't have much time to reflect as he moved right into the production of The Dead Zone the same year, effectively launching his brief career as a studio director. Videodrome seemed destined to become a kind of odd footnote, but over time, as its themes of altered perception and dangerous media become ever more relevant, the film has amassed a considerable cult following. It's been revealed as a prescient exploration of our ever-changing cultural and technological landscape, as well as a perfect summation of Cronenberg's perennial obsessions. In his world, 
thoughts and desires have an uncanny tendency of being made physical flesh. Technology functions as a literal extension of human anatomy, and aggressive diseases find new, creative ways to corrupt the mind and body. Videodrome explores these ideas in an extraordinarily visceral way, confronting us with intense imagery, rich in symbolism, and brought to life through incredible makeup effects designed by the great Rick Baker. Baker was fresh off his groundbreaking work on an American werewolf in London, winning the very first Academy Award for special makeup effects, and attracted by the challenge offered by Cronenberg's surreal story. He had originally requested six months of preparation time to construct the many prosthetic pieces that would be needed, but due to the film's low budget and tight schedule, he only got two. Baker's team pulled out all the stops to achieve the unforgettable hallucination sequences, including perhaps the film's most iconic image, an unusual new organ that spontaneously forms on Max's body, referred to as the stomach vagina. One particular scene required star James Woods to be connected to a prosthetic body built into a trick sofa on a raised set, a process that forced him to remain stationary and continuously standing for more than eight hours, and that was just for application, not to mention the additional hours required for filming. Woods later described the experience as almost unbearable. While Baker handled the physical side of the effects, the electronic side was handled by Michael Michael Lennick, who designed the film's many pioneering special video effects. Baker's team would be the ones responsible for, say, building television sets rigged with air bladders to make them pulse and breathe, and screens made from dental dam that would expand to engulf the lead actor, while Lennick had to figure out how to actually get the images onto those screens, eventually devising clever forms of rear and front projection. Even the normal televisions presented a problem. Camera shutters have a tough time capturing picture that appears on a TV screen, since video operates at 30 frames per second, rather than the film standard of 24 frames per second. Most filmmakers just add those images in later, using opticals, or today, digital effects. Videodrome, unconventionally, utilized full video playback on set, requiring Lennick, in collaboration with cinematographer Mark Irwin, to figure out how to modify their Panavision equipment so that the television images would be perfectly synced up with the camera shutter. Not all of the effects have aged so well, certain moments do betray Videodrome's low-budget origins, and the production design's clunky analog hardware will probably come off as a little quaint to modern viewers. But overall, the combined work from the effects team here is truly remarkable. Naturally, these were the days before CGI, so everything in the film had to be built and physically photographed. Plus, the gritty, retro 80s aesthetic only adds to the cyberpunk feel. Rick Baker himself has referred to this particular decade as the golden age of makeup effects horror films, where it seemed every year another landmark classic was being released that pushed the limits of what was possible a little bit further. Videodrome is especially distinct because not only is it not quite a horror film in the traditional sense, it approaches its effects psychologically rather than literally. This is a film about perception. It's about how easily perception can be distorted, altered, manipulated. It's about how so many aspects of our modern culture are built around doing specifically that, manipulating our perception of reality. Visual motifs like glasses, helmets, and especially television screens are omnipresent. The first character, the first image we see, is on a television screen. Characters are frequently introduced through television. One character, Brian Oblivion, is even seen exclusively via a television set. Cronenberg tells this entire story from a relentlessly subjective point of view. Max is in every scene. The whole narrative is experienced through his perspective. As he becomes less and less of a reliable narrator, Cronenberg refuses to make any kind of visual distinction between objective reality and Max's hallucinations, never resorting to obvious clues like wide-angle lenses or distorted colors. Whatever Max sees, we see. Simple as that. At a certain point, the story must deteriorate into pure fantasy, but we're never sure exactly when that happens. 
Cronenberg leaves it entirely ambiguous. We have no choice then but to accept everything at face value. This is Max's reality, however askew it may be, leaving us to wonder, is he in control of his actions? Is he being programmed? Is there really a conspiracy? Are these just Max's paranoid delusions? Is there even really a Videodrome signal? What the hell is actually going on? James Woods was born for roles like this. He's always been a dynamic actor, and his performance as Max is bursting with energy, tension, and paranoia. Deborah Harry, in one of her first film roles, projects a cool sexiness as Nikki, not unlike her stage persona as the lead singer of Blondie. Admittedly, Nikki isn't quite as strong a presence in the film as I would have liked. She very quickly becomes nothing more than a fantasy object for Max. We don't get many scenes actually exploring her character or their relationship. The whole movie has kind of a peculiar pacing. It feels very fractured, like there are crucial bits missing, no doubt due to Cronenberg's merciless editing practices and his constantly evolving script. In later scenes, this helps to enhance the hallucinatory quality, but in establishing scenes, it can leave a lot of story details rather murky. At only 89 minutes, the whole film just seems too quick. Or maybe its brisk pacing is actually one of its best qualities. It doesn't give you any chance to be bored, and Cronenberg certainly makes the most of that runtime, packing in as many ideas as those minutes will hold. So many, in fact, it's often to the detriment of his characters. He appears to be much more interested in exploring this story's intellectual and philosophical possibilities, rather than its emotional ones. His style feels detached, cold, like he's holding most of his characters at a distance. Even Max, at times, can seem more like a concept instead of a fully rounded character, despite Woods' efforts to the contrary. I want to know how he feels in certain key moments, but Cronenberg never attempts to communicate that to us. Ultimately, this film isn't really about characters. It's about images. It's about the undeniable excitement and allure of forbidden imagery. We're simultaneously drawn to and repelled by taboo, driven in a hungry search for ever more extreme spectacle to shake us out of our everyday numbness, all the while fearing we may somehow destroy our minds and moral values. What if those images were more than just images. In its hysterical realization of society's worst fears, Videodrome is an unmistakably Cronenbergian vision, an offbeat and provocative mix of horror, sci-fi, philosophy, and wry humor, possessing the sensibilities of a B-movie and the intelligence of an art film. It's so unique and strange that it was spared plans to be remade in 2009. After all, nobody but Cronenberg could so effectively ask the un settling question of whether or not the human mind, in all its susceptible malleability, is really the most reliable tool for deciphering our reality. Videodrome is not currently available to stream on Netflix or Hulu. It is available to rent or purchase video on demand through platforms like iTunes, Amazon, Vudu, YouTube, or Google Play, and has seen many physical media releases over the years from Universal Studios Home Entertainment. I suppose the most appropriate format to own this movie on would be VHS, or to be more precise, Betamax, but if you want my choice, I'd go for the Criterion Collection Blu-ray. Naturally, the film is presented unrated and uncensored in Cronenberg's original director's cut, features great video, great audio, great supplemental material, including a terrific audio commentary from the always fascinating writer-director himself. This is undoubtedly the best release by far. The case is even designed to resemble a bootleg tape, which is just perfect. Criterion discs are a little spendier, but they're absolutely worth the dough. If you're a horror fan who happens to be a little strapped for cash, wait for it to go on sale and absolutely pick this one up. If you'd like to learn more about Videodrome or writer-director David Cronenberg, check out some of the books I used to put together the information in this video, like Cronenberg on Cronenberg, edited by Chris Rodley, David Cronenberg, A Delicate Balance by Peter Morris, and David Cronenberg, Interviews with Serge Grunberg. There's also a wealth of information on the Criterion Blu-ray, too. This has been Cult Sandwich with Disregarding Henry. Please subscribe if you haven't already, like the video, leave a comment, and follow me on Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. You can also check out plenty 
plenty of other videos on my channel, like my review of Gaspar Noe's Irreversible, or how about a top five list of some of my favorite films featuring unsimulated sex. They're both good, take your pick. You can also check out the latest episode of my brother's show, Rough Cuts, where he looks at different versions of movies and compares and contrasts them. Episode two is on cult comedy classic, This Is Spinal Tap. Did you know there's a four hour version of that movie? Click on that link to hear more. And episode one is right there too, in case you missed it. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. Ah, Huh, how'd that get in there?